All right, we are going to go ahead and get started. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. I am Stephanie Berglund, the CEO of Thread, and we're so excited to um, have a conversation today about licensing, childcare assistance, COVID-19 mandates, and your business. And today is all a part of a series that Thread is doing um, called Thursdays with Thread. And it's meant to bring you the latest um, and uh, most important information about current COVID events, resources, information, and supports for you. Um, we know we're giving you a lot of information uh, written um, and on our website, but want to have uh, more opportunities like Thursdays with Thread to have conversations with you and um, have you hear from uh, experts and partners um, to connect you with uh, the supports and resources that you need. So we're really excited for today's session. Um, and I wanna uh, turn it over and introduce you to Micheline Smith, who's gonna help with, with, with some logistics today. Micheline is our great professional development specialist um, on our team at Thread. Micheline, I think you're on mute. Yep, thank you. Good afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> Gonna go into my whole spiel without taking myself off mute. So I just wanna go over the Zoom webinar controls really quickly. Um, to turn on or turn off your video, you're just going to click or unclick on the start video icon on the most likely on the bottom of your screen, sometimes at the, at the top of your screen if you are on a phone. And also to um, mute and unmute yourself, you are going to click on the speaker button. We do ask that you keep yourself on mute as much as possible so that we can hear the speaker as well. We encourage you to use your video, but um, that's at your comfort level. You can also click on the participants button and that will allow you to raise your hand or um, add other emojis or um, reactions to what the speakers are saying. We ask that you please direct all of your questions to the chat box um, and there will be people, people there to help you and also at the end of the session we will go through some question and answer. Um, I also want to ask you now to take a moment to make sure that you have put your first and last name in the chat box. This is important for taking attendance, especially if you are showing up as iPhone or some other undistinguishable name as you log in. So please make sure you put your first and last name in the chat box. I want to make sure that everybody knows this session is being recorded. However, training hours can only be earned by participating in the live session. The link to the recording will be available on Thread's website for informational purposes only. I also want to, if you are joining us today and would like to receive a certificate for attendance, we need to make sure that you return the evaluation to Juliana by September 3rd. So that's a week from today. And the evaluation should have been in the email that you received with the link to join us today. So you can click on that evaluation, complete it, and then just return it back to Juliana. And her information is here. It is also in the email that you received. Okay, I think that covers pretty much everything. Stephanie, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Micheline. We'll put um, these reminders in the chat. And again, uh, refer back to the uh, email that you received from Juliana that will give you more information. So, um, well, I'm excited to introduce our facilitator for today. Uh, Shirley Pitts, if you wanna wave, wave to everybody, Shirley. Shirley is um, a volunteer member of the Thread Board of Directors. She's also the owner of Pitts Consulting. Shirley, um, some of you uh, may or may not know, has a long history and been uh, an amazing leader in our early childhood sector in Alaska. She has um, great experience working in Head Start and for many years worked for the state of Alaska on things like early childhood strategic planning and data collection and has been, um, I think, most known as the leader and I would call her the mother of strengthening families in Alaska. So for those of you who are familiar with strengthening families, you can give a nod to Shirley and her great leadership. She led the Strengthening Families um, Alaska Initiative out of the State Office of Children's Services. So we're really happy to have her with us today. Welcome Shirley and I'll let you take it from here. All right, well, thank you for having me, Stephanie. Yes, I'm happy to say I've been a Thread Board member for a little over five years now, and it's been a tremendous experience for me and a real source of pride about the great work that Thread does. So I'm glad this is an organization that is uh, about helping childcare 
and facilitating the work that you do. And I just want you to know on behalf of the board, how much we, we, we just truly respect the work that you do. And we know the last several months has been a difficult uh, situation for all of us, but especially for you. And my hope is that when we emerge from all of this, people are gonna leave really recognizing the value of childcare and how we just don't function if we don't have you in place. So thank you very much for the, the work that you do each and every day. And, um, you know, for someone like myself, who's really spent their whole career focused on young children and families, I just, I know how valuable that is and I appreciate that. So today is pretty exciting. We have some great guests uh, from the state of Alaska and the municipality of Anchorage. And they're going to provide some important information, um, useful information that will help you in your own business with child care. And um, as we mentioned before, we'll be hearing from the presenters. We have three speakers and then we'll circle back and we'll take questions that are in the chat box. So as questions come up for you, please put them in the chat box and hopefully I can track that and get back to that when we've had our presentations. So our three speakers today are Amber Mavis, Stacia Collier, and Kathy Lynch. And uh, we'll start with Amber. She is a program coordinator too with the state of Alaska, the Division of Public Assistance in the Child Care Program Office. And Amber is responsible for the oversight of the Child Care Assistance, Child Care Grant, and the Alaska Inclusive Child Care Program statewide including oversight of the Child Care Assistance Program grants. After that, we'll hear from Stacy and Kathy. Stacia Collier is the Child Care Licensing Manager with the State of Alaska, also in the Division of Public Assistance in the Child Care Program Office. And Stacia is responsible for child care licensing statewide, including the oversight of the Municipality of Anchorage's Child Care Licensing Grant. And last but not least, we have Kathy, who is the Child Care Licensing Supervisor with the Municipality of Anchorage in their, in their health department. And she manages a team of licensing specialists and oversees inspections, as well as the department's grant and their budget. So they're the main presenters today, but we also have a couple of other special guests that were honored to join us today. So we're happy that we have Shonda O'Brien, who's the Director of Public Assistance in the Alaska Department of Health and Social Services. And we have Nicole Lebo, who is the Human Services Division Manager at the Anchorage Health Department. So thank you for joining us today, all of our speakers, and for Shonda and Nicole for taking the time to join us. And with that, we're going to turn this over to Amber, and she will talk to you about, let's see, she's going to be talking about child care assistance. So, Amber, take it away. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me. Um, as Shirley said, my name is Amber Mavis, Program Coordinator 2 with the State of Alaska Division of Public Assistance Child Care Program Office. I would like to begin by sharing information about capacity building funding payments. The State of Alaska uh, Division of Public Assistance Child Care Program Office received approximately $6.4 million from the CARES Act through the Administration for Children and Families, dedicated specifically for child care assistance. That along with $2.6 million in State of Alaska CARES Act funds was dispersed to licensed child care providers to cover March 2020 expenses. Payments were based on February attendance for all children in care. That included children who receive state child care assistance subsidies, as well as those who do not, are also referred to as private pay. To be eligible for this payment, providers had to have been open at least on March 1st, even if they closed temporarily after that date. Payments were calculated using the number of days of attendance of each child the age group of each child, and the provider's rates or the state rates, whichever was higher. These payments were made to providers in the month of May. Uh, through other State of Alaska CARES Act funding, the Child Care Program Office was also allotted an additional 10.5 million approximately 
to be distributed to licensed child care providers to offset a portion of lost revenue for the months of April and May. For this second payment and an attempt to distribute this amount as equitably as possible, the child care program office paid providers a flat rate of $200 if the provider was closed for the month um, that applied to April and May or $400 if the provider was open for any time uh, during those months. Times their license capacity per month for the service months of April and May. April and May totals were combined for each provider and providers were paid in one payment. So in total, licensed child care providers statewide received a little over $19.5 million. Um, and those were the capacity building funding payments. So the Child Care Program Office has issued 100% of the federal dollars received um, and does not anticipate any additional payments to assist in capacity building at this time. The Child Care Program Office also recognizes that many businesses are starting to reopen or have increased their enrollment and hope to be operating at full licensed capacity soon. In addition to these additional capacity building dollars, providers are encouraged to apply for relief funds through local municipalities, nonprofit relief uh, through the Alaska Community Foundation, other nonprofit organizations, um, and through the CARES or the Alaska CARES Act grant program. Thread Resource and Referral Network provides a lot of great resources and, and information on their website as well. So I would encourage you visit um, that website regularly as information can change quickly, um, as we've all seen and experienced over the last six months. So the next agenda item for child care assistance are regulations. Um, the division has submitted a request to relax some of the child care assistance program regulations. However, we do not have any updates at this time. If this should change, the child care program office will send out notification of those updates and changes. And then I also wanted to talk about um, just some requests and reminders um, specific to the child care assistance program. Um, local child care assistance offices are child care assistance program grantees who administer the program on behalf of the state of Alaska child care program office. The local child care assistance offices and the child care program office have received little information from families around the impacts of COVID-19 and few questions around um, family eligibility, whether or not there have been any changes to CCAP eligibility rules and requirements. Um, however, our office has received questions from partners, other agencies and organizations and community members. Um, if you're hearing concerns or receiving questions around the impacts of COVID-19, or child care assistance program eligibility rules and requirements. I just ask that you refer individuals back to the program. By doing so, it will help the local child care assistance offices and the state child care program office identify the impacts, the types of questions, the volume of questions, the needs of families, and any trends. It is good to remember that things can change from one day to the next. And if there are questions or needs change, families should contact their local child care assistance offices to ask those questions about eligibility rules and requirements and report changes as they arise. Individuals can also contact the child care program office policy mailbox. That email address is dpaccp at alaska.gov if they should have questions regarding child care assistance program regulations and policies and procedures. And just to repeat that email address um, for the child care program office, that is dpaccp at alaska.gov. Local child care assistance office contact information along with a map of the service delivery areas can be found on the child care program office's website 
located under Information for Families. The local child care systems offices include Alaska Family Services, Anchorage, who serve the municipality of Anchorage region, Alaska Family Services Central, located in Wasilla, and they serve the central region, Thread, located in Fairbanks, they serve the northern and southeast regions, and the Lee Shore Center, and they serve the coastal region. If partners or others receive child care assistance program inquiries or concerns by way of email, please forward those emails to the local child care assistance office and copy the policy mailbox, again, the DPA, CCP at Alaska.gov um, for awareness um, and information gathering. Um, if you don't know which office to send it to, just send it to the child care program office and we will assist with that. Um, again, this will help us track inquiries get a better understanding of what is out there and being asked and needed, help to ensure that questions are going to the right individuals, and that the correct and current information is being provided. So that brings me to the end of the child care assistance program portion of the presentation. Um, I thank you again for having me today and for everyone coming together to meet and share information. Um, and the, at this time, I'm going to go ahead and pass it back to Shirley. Thank you, Ambra. You're full of all kinds of good information there. So uh, what we're going to do now, and I would like to remind you, if you have questions, please put those in your chat box and we'll circle back to those for a conversation at the end. But now we're going to turn it over to Stacy and Kathy, um, who will talk to us more about child care licensing. So ladies you can take it away. Hello, this is Stacey Collier with Child Care Licensing with the State of Alaska. And I wanted to start off with saying thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to participate in this meeting today. I know it's been a few months since we've had a provider meeting and we wanted to be able to share some licensing updates with you. So today, Kathy and I will be sharing information respectively from each of our program standpoints. We'll be discussing our child care numbers, our program updates and COVID-19 reporting procedures. Kathy will also be sharing information on mitigation plan requirements for the Municipality of Anchorage licensed child care providers. The first thing we wanna share with you are how things are going and what our current child care numbers look like. So with the state of Alaska, since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, our numbers have fluctuated. Although some facilities have remained open this entire time, others have temporarily closed and remained closed this entire time. While the majority have temporarily closed and reopened, some have even had to do this several times. At one time, we had over half of the facility statewide temporarily closed. Things have been steadily changing and more facilities have reopened more recently. For the state of Alaska child care licensing, we currently have 189 facilities open and 52 temporarily closed. Most of the facilities that are still temporarily closed are facilities located in rural areas and preschools and after school programs located or associated with their local schools. I'm gonna now pass the speaking wand to Kathy for her to provide MOA child care licensing. Thanks, Stacey. Um, yes, it's the uh, same throughout uh, the municipality of Anchorage, facilities having been opened and closed and then reopened um, but currently we have 238 licensed facilities in Anchorage and of those we have 188 um, who are open and 50 who are temporarily closed. We do have some preschools planning to open up here for by the end of August, which would be next week. Uh, we have one in September and one in October coming up. So that'll reduce those numbers of closures. We do have um, two pending uh, school, school age program applications right now to help take on some of that impact of children not in school. So hopefully those will get uh, follow through and get open here in the next uh, week or so. Um, and we do have a couple of home uh, pending home applications right now. So that's um, current status for Anchorage municipality. And um, then we'll go back to you, Stacy, for some program updates. You gotta unmute yourself. 
Yes, I like to talk to myself. Okay, hello, back to me. Okay, so I always like to start off with like, what is the state of Alaska Child Care Licensing staff been up to? So during this COVID pandemic, our licensing specialists have remained working in the office, trying to keep that six feet of social distancing and safe practices to make sure that we all stay safe. And for the first few months, we are not doing on-site inspections. With all the unknowns, we decided for safety and of our staff, the providers and the children in care, it was best to remain put in the office and not to do any on-site inspections. Instead, we worked on several projects to keep us busy while staying safe. Many of you heard from us during this time when we reached out to facilities for status updates, answered your calls and email questions, and sent correspondence letters to gather compliance information. We always appreciate hearing from you, and especially during this pandemic. It's really important because although we were not going on site, we were still able to touch base with you on how things were going and to know that you were all safe. Some of the projects that we worked on while in the office were file reviews and database cleanup. During this time, we reached out to you to gather updated information and prepare for it, prepare for when it was time to go back in the field and be back on site. So as the months went by and those projects got completed, we were not seeing an end to this pandemic in sight. Facilities were still making decisions on opening or remaining closed for the summer. Because it had been months and months since the pandemic had started, our licensing timeframes were getting further out of compliance. There were still so many facilities not sure of their plans and it was still not safe to resume, resume normal practices. We decided to try a new process for conducting inspections, so we did virtual inspections. We had to create this as a new process, not knowing how long we were going to be able to maintain our status quo. Over the summer, we conducted announced virtual inspections with all of our facilities that were open and we were able to schedule with. Now that summer has come to an end and school has started back up again statewide, some virtual, some in person, and some mixed delivery, we ourselves plan to try to get some normalcy back into our licensing practices. We are federally required to conduct on-site inspections prior to issuing a license and at least one time a year unannounced. We recognize there was a need to try to catch up on some of our out of compliance inspection timeframes. So thus month, this month we resumed conducting on-site inspections and investigations, ensuring the following safety protocols, including wearing masks, washing hands frequently, using hand sanitizer and following social distancing of at least six feet apart while on site. We're conducting new facility inspections for a new facility inspection once an application is complete. We're currently completing the orientation virtually and then scheduling an on-site inspection to ensure regulatory compliance prior to issuing a provisional child care license. We are connecting, we are also conducting renewals. So for renewals, once we received a complete application and any change documentation, we're conducting the on-site inspection. Then we're following up virtually with any items still needed for compliance prior to issuing that biannual child care license. We are conducting unannounced health and safety inspections, including collecting documents while on site. We typically do at least one unannounced health and safety inspection each year, unless more are necessary um, to ensure compliance. We are also conducting unannounced on-site investigations. During an investigation, we will do a health and safety walkthrough of the facility, take photos, conduct observations, interview staff, and collect documentation. If additional follow-up is necessary, we will conduct that virtually. So that is what we've been up to. I will now pass it back to Kathy to provide MOA child care licensing updates. Thanks, Stacey. Um, so first of all, I would like to share and say a big thank you to Thread who initiated weekly partners meetings in early March for Thread staff, CCPO, and the Municipality Child Care Licensing Program, a leadership team, uh, to meet regarding the COVID pandemic. In the beginning, we were meeting twice weekly and have since moved to meeting once each week. Um, each meeting partner agencies share and discuss their government updates, uh, mandates, news, news from the field, sector updates, our actions, our services, our next steps, communication updates, and action items. 
And these meetings have been extremely fruitful as we discuss areas of concerns around the mandates, childcare program struggles, low enrollments, lack of supplies, low staff, what to do about trainings during COVID, keeping programs safe, funding needs, and how can threat and licensing help and what resources can we provide. And licensing has shared weekly updates of facility open close status. And being the resource and referral agency, Thread has been instrumental in researching the CDC website, Child Care Aware of America, funding resources, and too many to name here, um, and have kept you updated through their emails and online newsletters. We have all advocated for you, the providers uh, who have continued to provide child care so families can work. We appreciate we appreciate each and every one of you for your dedication and amazing work. And we appreciate Thread so much for initiating all this. Um, so what have we been doing since March, you may ask? Well, in late March, the MOA staff began teleworking just as um, the state was uh, we were working in their offices. We are teleworking and still teleworking as much as possible. Um, during this time, the specialists began reaching out to our providers, checking in on them, listening to your concerns, uh, sharing your concerns with leadership. And while working from home, um, they were all tasked uh, with reviewing each facility binder to ensure documentation was up to date, and if not, reaching out and requesting uh, these documents from you. Um, and at that time, all inspections were suspended as well. Uh, we have heard from many of you that our presence in the field has been missed. And we appreciate hearing that and knowing even though we are a regulatory agency and oftentimes are issuing the non-compliances, we are also a listening ear, a smiling face and a valuable resource to you. And we appreciate hearing that. Um, we have provided guidelines for COVID-19. We've sent out countless updates through emails, provided resources and online resources. We've maintained your facility status on the municipality's GIS mapping tool so that any uh, person, any parent can go look to see if, which facilities are open. We have provided training on the mitigation plans most recently, along with uh, providing a checklist and examples of writing mitigation plans. We've responded to numerous phone calls and emails and have and continued to keep our customer service counter open and operate business as usual as much as we can during these trying times. I'm still learning how to function using the Teams platform and Zoom and can totally understand the technical difficulties and challenges many of you face as we navigate the new normal. And as a reminder, if you do come to our building to drop off papers, make a payment, have a scheduled appointment with one of the licensing specialists, please wear a mask and be prepared to sign in, have your temperature taken and answer COVID related health screening questions. So now that the municipality is in phase three, we determined we could go back in the field to conduct inspections, but we needed to consider how to do it safely. So therefore, uh, an inspection policy was written, reviewed by our chief medical officer, Dr. Bruce Chandler, and approved by our HR department. An email was sent to all the MOA facilities, informing them of our plans to be back out in the field conducting inspections, using alternative techniques, and implementing new safety measures. So during the ongoing threat, during this ongoing threat, we will be minimizing contact time in the facility when possible to mitigate the potential spread of COVID. So safety measures that are, will be taken are pretty much the same as what the state is also doing. Um, all staff must be screened daily and prior to conducting any on-site inspections. So screening for our staff includes them taking their temperature, recording it, acknowledging by staff that they are free of any of the COVID related symptoms and whether or not they have recently traveled outside of Alaska. And then when on site, staff must wear masks, wash their hands and with soap and water and or use hand sanitizer and follow your facility's mitigation plan as well. Uh, the specialists will also be asking you, the licensee, the administrator, or whoever the person in charge at, the, at that time, if any staff or children have experienced symptoms, tested positive, and quarantined within the last 14 days, or if any staff, persons, or children have traveled within the last 14 days. 
And then CCL has a little checklist that they document that information on. Um, if there is a reported positive case at a child care facility, staff shall delay the inspection and consult with me, their supervisor. Uh, we want to make sure everyone is, is safe. So specialists do carry disposable masks. <clears throat> Excuse me, I get a dry throat. <clears throat> specialists do carry disposable masks and um, may ask the facility staff to wear one if you're, if you're not wearing one or if there's an anticipated contact time of 15 minutes or more or they are within six feet of one another and they can't maintain that social distancing. Specialists also will be carrying disposable gloves, shoe covers and hand sanitizer and sanitizing wipes. And they are asked to carry in minimal equipment and only necessary items to conduct the inspection. They do have some waste bags, uh, waste, you know, or like what we would call a fanny pack or something similar to that. We provided those to them so that they can carry their pens, their phone, their note tablet or whatever on, on them and not have to set their items down on any surfaces. And so now that um, we are doing the on-site inspections for new facilities, we're doing the on-site orientation is conducted through the Teams platform is whenever we can. And the applicant is used to ask to use their camera and have the LS walk, walk around their home with them or their center. And then, um, so that's kind of like a virtual pre-inspection and the LS can point out any of um, no, uh, areas of concern. And when I refer to an LS, I'm talking about the licensing specialist. Um, and then uh, when they, when she does go on site, then uh, it'll try to limit the amount of time, but we'll take measurements then and follow up on any concerns that we think she may have had noticed during the uh, pre-site inspection. And so the time on site may vary, but again, we're trying to recognize a limited amount of time we can, but, uh, and maintain that social distancing. During the renewal period for renewal licenses, compliance with all regulations is measured. Renewal inspections are typically scheduled unless a program did not receive an announced inspection in the past 12 months prior to license expiration. And, and as Stacy explained, federally we're required to do one unannounced monitoring inspection throughout the, the, light, the first each year of the license cycle. And so if an inspection did not occur and a lot of those did get delayed during the beginning of the onset of COVID, um, then we are conducting the inspection, a portion of that inspection unannounced. Um, and so we have techniques and our practices in place for that. Um, so during the renewal inspection, we are doing a phone interview, the same with what the state would be doing with the administrator, and we will be conduct uh, and requesting specific documents be submitted for review, either by email or if they can't email them in, they can mail them in. And oftentimes people are taking a photo of their document and sending that to us as well. And then during the on-site inspection, specialists will follow the program's own mitigation plan for screening. And again, as I said, they will wear a mask at all times. They will wash their hands with soap and water upon entering each classroom or at minimum using hand sanitizer, which they will carry with them. Um, so they will try to use the same pen and avoid using the program's materials. Uh, they will observe in classrooms for short amounts of time, maintaining the six foot distancing when possible. And they will limit the touching of surfaces, opening drawers, cabinets, et cetera. If they do need to see in something, they may ask one of the staff to open it instead of them opening those items. And then they will conduct the exit interview with the administrator or on-site person when possible or by phone and obtain a signature on the inspection checklist, which can be done electronically because our staff do have all have electronic surface pros that they go out and so all the documentation can be signed right on the screen and if they do sign on the screen they carry the sanitizing wipes that they can sanitize the pen before they pass it off to the uh, per, the administrator whoever signed that document and then they'll sanitize it again before they use it um, at the completion of the inspection the specialists will, if possible, wash their hands with soap and water again before leaving and or if they can't, once they get in their vehicle, they're going to use hand sanitizer again 
and at the first available opportunity, they will wash their hands with soap and water. Um, if specialists do plan to conduct multiple infections in a day, in the same day, they are required to don a clean face mask. And if they are gonna wear gloves, that they would you know, make sure they use clean gloves as well. So the health and safety inspections, also what we call the monitoring inspections, will are conducted at any time as they are unannounced. And the primary focus of those monitoring inspections is on the health and safety items, attendance records, for staff and children, uh, verifying staff to child ratios, verifying that there are current background checks for uh, all staff, especially new staff, and verifying that the new staff have met their health and safety trainings um, that are required if, unless there's still time to do, unless they haven't met that uh, deadline. Specialists will follow the same safety measures they do for renewal inspections. They will inform the person in charge the purpose of their visit and inform them of the inspection process. And so our staff have been out in the field for the last month and so far it's been reported that everything is going well. And again, as I said, a lot of our license, licensees are happy to see us again. And I think some of that is they, they, we've all been kind of lonely, we've all been kind of isolated. And so getting back out is someone I think that they can talk to. And, and I think it just makes them all feel really good to have that contact again. Um, investigations, we are, if a report of concern or a complaint has been received since the beginning of COVID, investigations still took place with some modifications um, when possible and as applicable. Specialists have been conducting portions, portions of the investigation telephonically when they can, uh, especially if it's for interviews, if they need to do some interviews or you know, follow up with the facility. Um, and so investigations during th phase three will look very similar to normal policy and procedures, with the exception that staff will follow all screening protocol for health and safety uh, measures when going on site. And if there is a report of concern or a complaint received, the you know, staff will consult with the supervisor or assign lead licensing specialists at which time a plan of action is developed to include appropriate safety measures. When person-to-person -person interviews are needed, the specialists will conduct them again, as I said, by telephone when possible to avoid direct contact. And that is all I have for what the MOA licensing program is currently doing for conducting inspections and investigations. And so I'll put it, put it back to you, Stacy. Thank you, Kathy. So our next topic is um, COVID-19 reporting procedures. And I hope um, that all of you were able to um, participate in the Thursdays with Thread meeting with Dr. Olson last Monday. She provided a lot of good information, um, information regarding whether or not somebody tested positive, if there was um, just, um, um, whether or not somebody tested positive or if there was somebody who had symptoms and what the difference between isolation and um, quarantine was, and that was really good information. For us, um, since the COVID pandemic started, there have not been any mandates requiring childcare facilities to remain open or to close. This has been a business decision for the facility to make, and we at Licensing have been able to answer questions and provide resources to help you make the right decision for your business. Please remember to notify your licensing specialist if you're going to be temporarily closed or when you plan to reopen after a temporary closure. It's important to ensure you communicate with your families and your staff and remind them to keep children and or themselves home if they are sick. If you have to report, if you have a report that a staff member or a child has symptoms of the coronavirus or positive test results, please take the proper steps to ensure the safety of everyone at your facility. By following those CDC recommendations and guidelines, then remember to seek assistance from your local health department and to report to your local licensing specialist um, what actions you have or are going to take. With that information, we'll document that information and um, follow up with you and ensure that everything is well and that everybody is well and that all of your procedures have been followed prior to reopening. And like Kathy mentioned, we are tracking those openings and closings, um, giving us trends and data throughout this whole pandemic. 
and um, we will continue to do that. And we will be here um, and available to answer your questions and provide any resources that we can. So now I'm going to pass it back to Kathy to talk about um, municipality link with shelter licensing information. Okay, thanks, Stacy. Um, so reporting temporary facility closures and reopenings, um, as Stacy mentioned, we are tracking those. Emails have been sent to all our MLA licensed facilities to report any temporary closures related to COVID to their licensing specialists and submit the notification of a facility emergency form CC65. It is um, also very important to notify your specialist when you reopen your facility so that we can put you back open and uh, know that uh, we don't want you to miss out on any payments or anything. So we wanna make sure that you are letting us know that you have reopened. If you cannot reach your specialist, you can email them, you can call them, uh, leave a message. You can contact our main desk at 343-4758 or email our general email box at ahdccl at muni.org. Uh, so yeah, make sure those are getting reported. And how do you report a positive COVID case? Well, CCL has also emailed a reporting form that we re created to all of our facilities to complete. Um, the re if there is a reported positive case or even a closed contact, we request you contact your licensing specialist or call our main number as soon as a positive case or close contact exposure is known and you'll be given guidance on completing the form and submitting it along with um, any other documents we may need, such as staff rosters, child rosters, you know, the classrooms where the exposure might have happened um, or where the caregiver or child was present. Your licensing specialist is a great resource and can help walk you through the next steps. We also pass on your information to our public health medical group for their information and recommendations. And the medical group is also willing to provide a customized or a generic notification letter of COVID uh, exposure you can use to provide to your families enrolled in programs in your program in the event one is needed if you don't have that already in, as part of your plan. And then um, the other topic that I wanted to just talk about a little bit is those mitigation plans um, that are required for the municipality only. As part of the municipality's phase three operating requirements for child care facilities, attachment E was updated June 17th. Uh, child care facilities when, within the municipality, as I just said, are required to have mitigation strategies to protect the health and safety of children, staff, and families. This means all facilities had to write, share with their parents, train staff on, and maintain hard copies of their mitigation plan at each location. Facilities were provided some additional training by the CCL staff and division manager, Nicole Lebo, along with being given a checklist to follow and a few examples were shared. A copy of the plans had to be submitted to the CCL program for the facility licensing binder. And those were due to CCL mid-June and we kind of extended that for, you know, to at least get those turned into us by the end of June. So now that your plans are in place and time has passed, and many of you may now have experienced their, your first COVID, uh, case of COVID in your workplace, we strongly suggest you maybe take a minute and review those plans and determine, do they still meet your program needs? Do they say what you want them to say? Um, it's okay to make changes as you live through this. Um, and just a reminder, if you do make changes, please be sure to send an updated copy along with the checklist to your licensing specialist so we have the most current version in your binder. And also make sure you're, you're distributing any new plans uh, to your, your families. So we want you to plan for COVID now. Don't wait until it hits because it will. Assume there will be exposure or positive. And we just, will you be re prepared? Do you know what your plans are for exclusion or program dismissal? How quickly can you close if need be? Do you have the latest information from CDC or other resources? Do you know the difference between self-isolation and quarantine? What are the differences in low risk, moderate risk, and high risk? And um, you had a, at the last thread, Thursdays with Thread, Dr. Olson talked about that. And, what needs to happen to reopen? What are your, pro your plans for staff to return to work if out due to, positive, to a positive test? 
do you have extra staff to cover in the event one, two, or maybe more are out? Um, if you don't have the staff to meet ratios, you may have no choice but to close. And so these are all types of questions that we want you to be thinking about if you have not already, because you know we get asked these questions a lot. Um, and we're just gonna try to keep asking you back the questions and trying to walk you through it. And so when possible, we will help connect you to the public health experts who can assist in answering some of these difficult questions. They're difficult times for all of us as we continue to navigate this uncharted territory. COVID information is changing and evolving daily and we don't have all the answers. We wish we did. We wish we could just say, yep, you're good. Or nope, you need to close for five days, three days, 14 days, um, but we can't give you those answers. Um, but we're here to support you and do what we can to guide and assist you in making those tough decisions for your programs. So in, in closing, I would also like to share uh, with you, we have, been provide, we have been provided with some yard signs for facilities to display. Um, I'm gonna try to be Vanna. Here's one of them. It says, wear a mask. And we also have three other ones that say, watch your feet, feeling sick, stay home, uh, and wash your hands and wash them often. We also have some stickers that we're, we've been provided. Seriously, wash them. Here's one. If you're happy and you know it, wash your hands. Actually, regardless of your emotional state, wash your hands. And then there's another one here that says, love is everywhere, so is the flu. Wash your hands. So we have these different stickers available and these yard signs. Um, and what we're going to do is put them down at our health department at the entry by the security desk. And you're welcome to come pick, pick them up um, between 8 and 5.30 p.m., Monday through Friday at the health department. So please feel free to come and get them. And they also, the sign does come with a little stake that you can put it in the ground. Um, and lastly, I want to remind both our MLA and SOA facilities the importance of checking your emails. It is our main source of communication to quickly get information out to everyone. So please check those emails if your email changes, make sure you get that updated with your licensing specialist so we can update our databases. Um, and I would just like to say thank you for all, thank all of you for your time today and for the hard work that you do each day to care for our children, providing them a safe and nurturing environment. Uh, for many now becoming their substitute teacher during these challenging times. You are our heroes and thank you so much. And either back to Stacy or someone else. Thanks. Stacy, do you have any additional comments for the moment? Nope, that's it. That was all that we had for licensing. I think we're ready for questions. Okay, that was a ton of information. All three of you ladies, thank you very much. Uh, so we do have a couple questions in chat. Um, and maybe while we're waiting to see if some more get entered there, I have a question for all the speakers. And really it's about what you see the biggest challenges or differences that the field can be expecting or is experiencing right now. Um, what are the biggest changes or differences you think is it everything? And that's for all three of you, so. Yeah, this is Ambra. Um, I think, I think just the, the changes that occur daily, um, Kathy said it really well, um, you know, things change daily. We don't have all the answers. And, and that is so true, um, I think, in work life and personal life. <laughs> and we're all just trying to balance it all and just really be supportive of everyone everywhere where they are. Um, so I think that would be my, my two cents on, on that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ambra. Stacey so for, or Kathy, do you have anything to add? Uh, I think for us, for licensing specialists, um, like I said, for the state of Alaska, we've remained in the office because we were able to do that social distancing and, and maintain our work life um, at work safely. 
um, and take, you know, other people in our offices have been teleworking. So it's been different for us. Our office is like a, um, our entire building, I could say, <laughs> is like um, a ghost town. There, none of the cafes are open. Um, if you don't bring your own food, you're living off vending food, vending machine food, if there's even anybody filling up the vending machine. Um, so I think people have stepped up to try to help take care of each other while we're there. Our, you know, um, our needs and our mental health status is checking in on each other, checking in on our families, um, checking in on our coworkers that have children at home, that they're working with their children, trying to work and do school or not have child care and provide the care and work as well. Um, pro providing support to our providers when they call in, trying to get them the resources that they need, um, like Kathy had said as well. For us, we've been, you know, recommending CDC guidelines, um, providing them thread um, information for thread um, website to provide um, resource and referral information from them as well. And it's just trying to be there for each other. I mean, I think that recently in Alaska, um, you know, this last year, or um, maybe it's been over a year now that we had the earthquake. And I feel like the same thing, people stepped up and helped each other out. And we have great partnerships with our partner agencies and be able to communicate with each other and help our providers in any way we can. And our families um, at the child care program office, we have, um, we're fortunate to be able to help both sides of them, the families and the providers, and just trying to see how we can advocate to help both sides of that, work with our partner agencies to um, get information out to them. And I just, I mean, I just appreciate everybody. I think Alaska, we are really strong. And I've heard nationally how other, um, other licensing agencies um, ha did not have certain things in place and were really struggling and asking for support from other staff. Um, and I just think we've done a really good job here in Alaska and I'm proud of us and proud of all of our partner agencies um, and all the work we've done. I'm so proud of our providers. Some of our providers have stayed open this entire time. They've stuck out, it out, trying to help families, doing the best that they can, providing mm -hmm. care for essential workers when nobody was working. Um, so it's just been really trying times and I'm just proud of all of them. So I think that's the challenge is just it's been trying and we're all learning day by day. Thanks, Stacey. I know, I think how we cope with this is just, sometimes that's very individual because we cope differently with things, but I think for many mm -hmm. of us, limbo and being in constant transition is harder mm -hmm. than facing bad news sometimes because we just can't predict from day to day and, and it's a moving target. So I think as everybody's busy supporting families and programs, we have to support each other and really be mindful of our own wellness and that takes work it really does so thank you for all the work that you're doing now i guess another question um we had was are you seeing any trends or any innovative practices from programs um are they doing smaller groups or just doing anything that is sort of out of the box that you think is sort of wow that's a good idea are you seeing anything that you don't normally see I think for, for the state standpoint and what our licensing specialists have heard and seen, um, I, I think it's kind of comical at the very beginning of all of this when school first, you know, went out and providers were still trying to provide care and they were like, um, we got so many facilities calling to say they were telling on themselves for using screen time too long and that it was using screen time too long because it was their fault because they didn't know how to use the technology and they were trying to help the kids sign into their Zoom classes and other things. So, you know, we just said, you know, grin and bear it and say, we're, we're working on what, you know, what we can, we understand that we're in a very special situation right now with this pandemic. And we appreciate everything that you're doing for the families and the children and yourself and your staff. And, um, you know, we've heard that the tribal agencies too have like helped with the thing that I heard recently that was kind of surprising to me and very exciting was that not only, um, providers have helped each other with resources on where to get cleaning supplies and how to get cleaning supplies and letting each other know when a certain store is allowing more than one and um, when other other ways to, um, you know, provide themselves the things that they needed to stay um, open was that some tribal agencies were also offering assistance with cleaning, like cleaning services to help facilities if there was, you know, an outbreak or, um, you know, a positive case or something and they needed to clean in order to 
get back open. And that, that to me was something that um, was refreshing to hear and something that was outside of the box. I didn't even think about that. You know, we were hearing how people needed supplies and still in some areas um, needing supplies and where to get those. Um, but that was something out of the box that I heard. Kathy, did you have anything specific for your there, uh, I haven't seen a lot. I mean, I, there's been lots of creative ideas and I know a lot of programs are kind of low in numbers. And I, I did hear that like one program, I think it was back in the hunker down when they had closed for a little while, but they continued connecting with the children by having Zoom time. And so that was kind of neat to know that um, even though they couldn't see their friends, they connected for circle time and that was cool to see to hear that they were doing that um and i'm hearing that you know a lot of programs are, are getting kids outside more uh spending more time outside to have that fresh air and that you know where they can play further apart and not be in the confined spaces and so that's been a positive if the rain would just go away so they can get back out there more um so those are uh just a couple of things that i can just think of off the top of my head right now that uh as far as trends um or innovative ideas i don't know that they're that you know i mean a trend or not but it's just good to see that they are trying and they're wearing the masks and and making it a fun fun way to wear a mask too i've seen that as well so I'm encouraging if they are wearing masks to have some creative fun patterns that that aren't scary looking so um that's what I've seen so far. I think it may be very interesting to see what if, what of these practices will stay with us after COVID. You know, maybe we'll, maybe it'll be a permanent thing that we build relationships over Zoom and we get outside more, but um, time will tell. Okay, we have a couple questions in the chat we want to get to to make sure we answer these. This is from Donna Kelly, and it's a training question about CPR and FA training. So her question is, what are the requirements when classes aren't being offered due to COVID? What should providers do? So um, early at our last provider meeting that was um, back in May, I want to say, um, we provided resources for online courses for CPR first aid. Um, so if they are available, we have a regulation that allows that when they're not available, that you can take the online course until the next um, face-to-face -face course is available. So we would encourage them to do the online course so that they keep their um, certification up to date and then take the next available online. And I think that those um, facilities or those um, agencies that are doing the online, they're waiting until it's safe and then they're doing like the testing. So they're giving them like a temporary um, certification. There were some agencies also extending certification. So if you notify um, the agency that you got your certification from, you may be able to get an extension until it's safe to do the online. Okay, thank you. Uh, from Carrie Spain, um, you were asking about a form, um, Carrie. I wasn't sure what form that was, and you wondered if it was going to be sent out again. So I'm wondering, could you uh, maybe chat and tell us what form that was, and we can get back to that question. While we're waiting for that, Monica Lindren uh, asks, if we have a positive COVID, face, or COVID case at our facility, who will do the assessment of risk and the days that the facility should be closed? Kathy, I don't know if you want to answer that or if you want me to. Well, um, if I understood the question correctly, usually if there's any, uh, can you repeat the question, Sharon? Sure. If we have a positive COVID case at the facility, who will do the assessment of risk and the days that the facility should be closed? And that, that, that's where it's a hard one. Um, but of course, I think you would need, they would be connected with the public health nurse who would determine and they do that contact tracing. And so with those conversations, they've kind of got to figure out how much time who those children were in contact with or the caregivers. And it's, and that could be a question we might have to put towards our medical officer on, on the municipal side, because uh, we really can't determine that assessment of risk, but we can surely reach out to get some help with that if they need the help. And I was okay. gonna say for the state, um, we have been referring people to their local health department 
um, for those public nurses to be able to walk them through, ask the questions, and then provide them that guidance. Um, we've heard different um, outcomes of that, and it's based on that specific, I think, after they've done that assessment, it's the results of that assessment has have um, resulted in different outcomes. So it's really important to um, contact your local health department to get that public health nurse. Um, they're the experts in this, and they can help to um, provide those assessments. Great, thank you. Um, Carrie got back to us and she said, um, it was a COVID reporting form, and I'm not sure if that was you, Kathy, or Stacy mentioned that, but she was wondering um, if that form could be sent out again, or if they should have received it, or is it posted on a website somewhere? Um, it's not on our website, um, but we definitely can uh, send it back out um, if she would send us her um, name, contact information and send it and send her request either to the licensing specialist or to our general email box, which is on the screen right now, we can definitely get that sent back out. Um, and usually if there is a case and if she, if you're calling in, we can definitely email the form again. Um, so either way, we'll, we'll get that to you. Okay, yeah. great. And also I think Carrie is um, a state provider. Oh, so okay. she may not have received that because if it was a requirement specifically for the municipality of Anchorage to fill out, um, but we can provide any resources that she needs. Thanks, Stacey, for that clarification. <laughs> okay, what do we do? This is uh, from somebody on their iPhone. What do we do if a child is in close contact with a positive COVID person and attends the child care? Well, I think um, for the state, that, like we said in our presentation, we would want them um, to be asking the questions and making sure that their staff and children are, um, haven't been exposed or aren't sick while they're in the child care facility. And when they discover that, um, that would be um, a good time to contact the health department to see what their next step should be. If the child's not sick and, and we heard from Dr. Olson last week that they it, it can be a long period of time um, before they show any symptoms. Um, so if they hear that, they should probably confirm that with the family and then um, have the family contact the health department to see what their next step should be and also the facility to see what they should do as their next steps. Okay. All right, to your knowledge, has there been any positive cases in any childcare in Anchorage? And this is from Kendra. So I will just say that for um, specifically it's confidential information to share whether or not there has been a positive case or not. I think providers talk to each other and they probably know that information. Um, I think that we can share that we've had facilities that have closed because of exposure um, and then they've taken the pro um, proper protocols and reopened under those measures. That's all I can say about that. <laughs> that would be the same with the municipality. Um, Okay, we have a question from Dana Williams. Is there any resources, are there any resources currently available to help support care facilities who are helping with the virtual school? This is about resources available. So one of the things I would just say um, is resources I'm not positive, I would refer them. I would, if somebody called me and asked me that question, I wouldn't know specifically. I would have them call Thread or ask their local school district to see if there were resources available. Um, we want to make sure that, like, we appreciate that the providers are stepping up and helping the children with their school, but just to remember that they are care providers and not teachers, so they really need to, you know, separate themselves and make sure that they're providing the care and making sure that all the children are safe and healthy and um, supporting them in any way they can. Um, we've had some anxiety um, on our part. We've had facilities call prior to school starting with some anxiety about how are we gonna provide, how are we gonna be a teacher and how are we gonna teach these lessons? And I think really um, in all school settings, whether it's homeschool or the school districts and virtual school, partial in school, out of school, um, that they do have a teacher and then um, those resources and I think that they're just expecting that person at home to assist them on logging into their Zoom classes and um, making sure, you know, helping them if they need um, 
assistance on a place to do their homework or their um, assignments, but to just remember that hopefully those children all have teachers and um, to refer to the teacher when they need help with that. Okay, thank you. And then, Kelly, oh. we've had some, some of the similar concerns with caregivers worrying about how are we going to do this, how are we going to do school, and um, again, uh, as far as providing school and providing the care, um, because some of them feel like they were competent in doing both. They're they're there to be their caregiver, but then you know feel like they could do the schooling part as well. But um, again, you know we're would refer them back to the school district to look for some resources or maybe Thread has some. I, I'm not putting Thread on the spot, but just, um, yes, yeah, those are concerns. And I, my hat off to those who are doing both. Um, I'm, uh, as far as trying to have a little virtual classroom and provide that care at the same time. So I, I applaud you. <laughs> That's amazing juggling act for sure. Kendra is asking, is there a list of schools that are currently offering childcare for school age children? And are there contact numbers for these programs? Is that a question for Thread? Yeah, so I don't know if specifically if you're asking about like before and after school programs that previously like the Boys and Girls Club or Campfire or YMCA's that were providing those programs in schools previously. And that would be um, to look at the list of what facilities are open. I don't know myself and I'll let um, Stephanie and Kathy join in if they know of any schools that are providing child care, the actual school. Okay. And um, Kelly uh, from Fairbanks has put in the chat that in Fairbanks, there are no outside groups allowed in the schools. This is Stephanie, I'll, I'll dovetail onto Kelly that I think, um, and, and to Stacy's earlier point that it might be best to contact your local school district to find out what, what supports are in place through the school districts. But um, much like you all are doing a juggling act, I think it's, I think, we are all aware that school districts are doing that as well. Um, and um, to my knowledge, I don't know of school districts offering alternative um, care and learning options. So um, we do know that there are licensed um, programs like yourselves that do have vacancies for school age care. So we're trying to keep those as up to date as possible at Thread. So if um, if you know of people who need school age care, you know you can contact our referral line. Um, to get that direct support or check out uh, the referral services online. Um, and I would just say in the flip of that, if you all have vacancies or you know have room for school age children to make sure your information is updated at Thread so we can be marketing that for you as well. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, we do have in the chat, Starbright says that they're open for after school care to assist in an online learning. And they have their phone number there of 562-1414. So I have a question sort of to, to give to programs or to put back on you. What, what do you need most now from the child care program office or the Muni? What can they do to be most helpful to you? See if we get some ideas coming up. While they're thinking of that, I think we all need a hug, virtual or, you know, we haven't been able to have real hugs. <laughs> Even yeah. those virtual hugs, we all need a virtual hug. <laughs> we have to figure out ways to, you know, reach out and do fun things and support each other in any way we can. Yeah, it's been quite a lesson in how important that touching and all those small things that we used to take for granted are, really. Yeah, well, a smile with your mask. So you have to do the eye, you know, Get your eyes <laughs> when you're in public and you have to smile, like especially with children too. If you're wearing a mask and they don't know, I had my grandchild recently, she's nine months old with me at the store. And of course we're masked up, she was sleeping. So I had her like car seat covered, but I had to run through the store real quick 
and you know everybody was stopping me because it was like a baby and then they were like she can't see me smiling I'm like it's all right it's okay we gotta get out here. But yeah so yeah we just have to remember that too because children can't see our facial expressions and we have to be more expressionate with our eyes and something so that, that's a good yeah. one. I'll have to remember that. Maybe take the glasses off or something so you can see the eyes because it's like you're in the store and and it's like, oh, excuse me, you know, and I'm trying to be friendly about it, but they can't see me smiling. And so, right. you know, it's hard. You just got to have more, use your body language more, I think. Yeah. Um, and you can't, you know, touch people, <laughs> you know, this is things that we used to do, you know, reach out or I try to just like wave and smile at little kids I try to but then I'm like oh they can't see me so I wave and I like try to you know make my facial expression because I just I 100% feel sorry for little kids during this entire time like their whole worlds have been rocked and mm -hmm. uh, I just want to reach out to all those parents and the providers and everybody and say thank you so much and keep taking care of them the best that we can and hope for the best out of this. I do have to say, um, I live very near to a bike trail and I do a lot of hiking and it has been amazing to me to see the families out. There have been more buggies going by my house <laughs> and more dads with babies in, you know, the little front loader there going up flat top. I mean, it's it's been amazing to me to see how many people are getting outside with their young children and I'm thinking, Maybe that's a silver lining that families are spending more time together and they're getting out more. It's it's pretty remarkable. I hope they continue that when this is all over and done. So Sheer has, let's see, examples or format for those of us making mitigation plans in our three to five program for guidance. So it sounds like something that would be helpful to share. Do we have those examples that we could? We, um, we did have some examples that we sent out to programs um, when they initially, when we were having them write their mitigation plans, and we can definitely send those out again. Um, please, either we can send them to everyone, or if, or I, if you would just put your send us your email address through our general email, we can uh, get those sent back out to you if you need some examples. So and I can I, contact you. Yeah, to um, always look online too. There's probably some great resources out there uh, to write those plans. Okay, great. And we have another question from Jessica Liska. With flu season coming up, how are we to figure out COVID versus flu? Or does everyone have to be tested every time? Wow, that's a good question, Jessica. First, everyone go get your flu shot, first of all. Um, what do the rest of you think about that? Just about every symptom that's on the COVID list is a symptom of something else, and it makes it very difficult. Um, so I, that's like a, a decision that people have to make. Do I go get tested because I got the sniffles? You know, all of a sudden during this presentation, my nose decided to run. And it's like, why now? And I think it's just because <laughs> this building is so cold. <laughs> we don't have any heat right now. So, um, so I, um, but it is, it's one of those. And I think as a conversation you might have with your, your doctor, your medical per, you know, person, whoever you see. Um, and also think about, well, have you been around anyone recently who may have had it because they're, it's, that, it's a sneaky one and there's so many people out there asymptomatic. So if you have, I, I'm not the doctor, I'm not the medical expert, but you know, is it one symptom, is it two symptoms, or do you have to have three symptoms before you get tested? So those are things you need to ask your medical professionals um, because it's, it's not one that we can easily answer for you. There was an interesting article in the paper, I think maybe just this morning or yesterday, talking about they are anticipating a lot less flu this year because of what are people are doing to protect themselves against COVID. So at the same way it mitigates COVID by wearing a mask, it should help decrease our flu. But yeah, you probably have to find that diagnosis. 
Yeah, the other thing recently, I have um, two family members that are first responders and um, one of them is a police officer and he had symptoms. Um, I think the symptom that was a fear was the loss of smell, which is what they say, you know, so he immediately went to get tested and reported it to work. And um, they, the, the thing that I learned recently that I did not know is that um, there are a lot of, there are, um, you can be tested and test negative too soon. Um, if it's within a, uh, I think he said within the first two or three days, um, you may have a negative test. So though he had a rapid test that was negative, they also sent away for a state lab test and had him test again prior to being able to return to work to make sure. And thankfully, um, all the test results were negative, but they also um, recommended to get that second test. So that was something I hadn't heard because I know people were trying to get rapid tests as soon as they could to get back to work. And that was something that they shared with them is that um, sometimes if you're just newly freshly could be um, have COVID, but it may come up negative in the rapid test, they'll, they'll send it away for state lab to get um, additional results to make sure. Good advice. Well, are we out of questions? Is there, um, are there any other questions people have before we start to wind down here? We have a little time left, but there is absolutely nothing wrong with ending early. I have a question. Okay, Maria. Um, yes, I, um, right now is free and you can do the test, but how, when is, you need to be paid? And I live in Kodiak, in Kodiak, everything is expensive. And right now it's free. You can go like uh, uh, the native clinic and, and it's free. But in the future, you never know. So your question is how maybe people could get assistance paying for that, Maria? Yeah. Because here in Kodiak, yeah, you know, in Kodiak, um, the rates for the childcare is very low. Yeah. Yeah, I think definitely you would it, want to reach it's out very, to Yeah, and it's very expensive, everything. And right now it's free. I, I, I have, I, I, right now I get two tests and, and I'm, I'm happy, it's, it's negative. But right now it's free. But in the future, I don't know, you need to be paid by your packet or, you know? Right. I think my, my suggestion would be um, if they stop that free resource would be to connect yourself with your local health department and see if there's other resources available um, or your insurance if you have insurance or um, but definitely your health department to see if there's other resources available. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, is there, uh, are there any comments from the speakers or Stephanie for you? Uh, from you for just good of the order before we thank folks and say goodbye today. Thanks, Shirley. Any other comments? Oh, actually, from I'm sorry. Actually, um, I I think I need to put my name, and you can see the list. I be I be um, in the class. Yes, Maria. Are you able to share that in the chat? Um, because I don't know how to put in my name. Can Jesenia Cruz, can she do for me? Yes, that would be great. Okay. Thank maybe you. She's, maybe she hear me. Jesenia, can you make, uh, can you do please for me? Maria, okay. She do it. Thank you. Yeah, Excellent. I do it ready. Thanks for helping I do each other out. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yes, thanks. You know, Kelly does have a question, Stephanie, in the right. chat. Maybe we should get to. Um, this is for Ambra. If a family has childcare assistance and the child is in childcare doing remote school, will, I'm not sure I get the question here. Um, if a family receives childcare assistance, the child's in remote school at the childcare program, are they covered when they are technically in school? So right now there have been no changes to regulations. So the if the child is only eligible for before and after school care um, and has been authorized at a part month, 
um, that is what they are eligible for and what the provider is eligible to be paid. Um, however, I will say that, you know, a number of children throughout the school year um, are also eligible for a full month if they're, um, if there's an in-service or school holiday um, during that month and they need at least one full day of care, um, they're automatically eligible for a full month already. Um, so in many cases, children are already authorized at a full month. Um, so now they're in childcare also for those full days. Um, so in those situations, the child, the child is authorized at a full month. Um, but for others who don't need a full month, um, they just need a part month for before and after school care, um, say they have other arrangements for in-service and school holidays. Um, at this time, they're not eligible for an increase in um, coverage. Um, but as I said um, during the presentation, um, should that change, um, we will be sharing that information with everyone. Okay, thank you, Ambra. So back to you, Stephanie. Yeah, thank you, Shirley. Um, big thanks again to our uh, speakers and guests, um, our partners, Stacy, Ambra, and Kathy. Any final comments or thoughts you wanted to add before we wrap up? I just want to again thank the providers for taking time out of their busy schedules. I really know that um, it's important for us to be able to connect, and I really appreciate it. And thank you for all that you're doing out there for us all. Great, thank you. I would I would echo that. I know your um, time is really precious right now, especially in the middle of the day when many of you are also providing uh, care and services. So we really appreciate it. Um, I did want to um, just note, uh, Jen. Clark's chat um, from Thread that we can offer you assistance and support if you need help with mitigation planning. So you can uh, walk through that process with our professional development team and staff. So you can feel free to call us. She put her email in there um, or just contact Thread and, and we can assist you um, and provide that support. Um, whether you're in the Muni where it's required and that's evolving um, or if you're anywhere in the state and wanna to put together a mitigation plan um, to align with your uh, policies and procedures, we, we can assist you with that. So um, we're also interested in just hearing from you in general, what other resources and supports do you need right now? So it sounds like there's ongoing questions about maybe how to continue to pro provide support for school-aged children who may, um, may be in your care right now um, that would not typically be in your care if there was school in session. So um, maybe we can look at ways to follow up uh, with that as well. So just let us know what other supports and resources that you need and we'll do our best to connect you with those. So thank you again to Shirley um, and all at Thread who are supporting us in this effort and um, again to the state and municipality for being great partners with us in this effort. So with that, I think we'll close and hope you all have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.